I have the pleasure of introducing you today to Dr. Scott Steiger. Um, a little bit about him. He grew up in southeastern Kansas, and I thought that was interesting because I actually don't know anyone from Kansas. So you're the first one, I'll always remember that. Um, he's moved all over the country for various jobs, including doing his medical school and the, I'm gonna, at Washington University and residency at the University of Washington. Got that right, not to get those mixed up. Um, he finally joined the USCSF faculty in 2012, where he initially worked at our Mount Zion campus and transitioned to San Francisco General Hospital in 2016. He is board certified both in addiction medicine and internal medicine. He is, as you can see on the screen, the deputy medical officer of the opiate treatment pro outpatient program at San Francisco General, where he also works as a primary care physician and um, sees patients in the clinic and on the inpatient wards. Uh, Dr. Steiger's primary research and academic interests are in addiction medicine and its treatment. And so we have the pleasure of welcoming you today and he could Tell us everything, he, well, not everything he knows, he knows a lot, but he's gonna tell us um, about medications for opioid use disorder and how that saves lives. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Kathy and thanks folks for coming. Um, this is, uh, these slides are uh, developed originally for, from a report from the National Academy of Sciences, uh, Engineering and Medicine. Um, our report was called Medications for Opioid Use Disorder Saves Lives, or Save Lives, and it came out about a month ago. Um, but I was working on that um, for about seven months. Um, this committee uh, was originally titled Medication Assisted Treatment for Opioid Use Disorder, but the members of the committee didn't like it because, uh, as you'll hear, for reasons that you'll hear later, we didn't like the assisted part. Um, the sponsors of the committee uh, were the National Institute on Drug Abuse and uh, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Ad Services Administration, so two governmental agencies. And our charge was fourfold. It was to review all of the knowledge about how effective or ineffective medications for opioid use disorder or opioid addiction are, to examine how those medications can most effectively be delivered and to whom and where, and then try to identify any challenges in how uh, that treatment gets implemented and where it gets implemented. Um, and then also, of course, it being, you know, NIDA being one of the funders, uh, it was to identify any additional research that's needed uh, to uh, make treatment better. Uh, the, I was honored to be a member of the committee. It was a very um, August group of people and then me, um, people who've done a lot of research on uh, treating addiction and in policy work. Um, we also had a patient on the committee. Walter um, Ginter represents the Medication Assisted Recovery Services uh, Network in New York. Um, we had nurse practitioners, social workers, um, psychologists, uh, public health practitioners, um, basic scientists, and um, a couple uh, medical doctors. And, and so, you know, why, why did they ask us, why did they form this committee? Uh, it's because of the incredibly high numbers of people who are dying uh, from opioid overdose. Most recent figures from 2017 are almost 50,000 people across the country died of opioid overdose. If you combine that with other uh, substances, um, the numbers get up to over 80,000. Um, in combination with the death, there's increased morbidity, so other types of diseases that travel along with um, especially injection use. Uh, HIV and hepatitis C being the most prominent ones. And the, the cost to society is greater than just the large number of lives lost. It also includes an increase in healthcare costs, loss of productivity, criminal involvement, problems in just at the ba most basic level, problems on families. And it's with that in mind that I thought that we would sort of talk about uh, this report in the context of a case. Um, this is a uh, patient of mine. Uh, n uh, name has changed. 
Um, and, it, and, it, and I do this because, I mean, the numbers are really impressive in that way that a giant tumor is impressive, and they're scary, but it, it really, to me, uh, hits home when we think about it in the context of, a, of an individual. And so I'm going to tell you about a patient of mine that I'm calling Anna, and she was born, um, I have, I've known her for a long time, so she was born at full term to a mother who she says was young and healthy and a school teacher. <laughs> Uh, I didn't know her when she was a baby. I'm just an internist, not a, not a family practice doc. So her, she said her father was, was working when she was, uh, when she was born. He was also healthy. Um, and she actually, apparently, was uh, all the way healthy. Um, she does say that when, her, her, when she turned about two, uh, her father lost his job, and, and her mom said that there was a lot of stress in the house. Um, uh, apparently, on several occasions, uh, police were called to the house after reports of domestic violence. And she gets a little bit older and gets to school and is like school. She's doing well, first and second grade. Um, but eventually, in around, uh, I think she said third grade, uh, her father had been arrested twice for driving under the influence, and her mom moved them out, Mo moved them out of the house. And so um, she says that at the time, she didn't think uh, too much of it. It was scary at first, but she says that she still continued to do well in school and had friends. Um, when she was 12, 13, she was at a party, and a friend had snuck a beer out of her parents' house, and she offered it to her. And Anna said that you know, her, her feel, it made her feel more energetic and more comfortable in her skin. And so she started you know, going with that friend to parties where alcohol would be available with the older kids. Um, not long after that, she actually tried Vicodin for the first time, uh, a pain pill that has opioids in it hydrocodone specifically. And, and the thing she says is the same thing that I hear from a lot of patients uh, who, who end up in my care, and that is, it was, she says that when she first took it, it was the first time she felt 100% right. Like, it took away all pain and anxiety. So she started trying to make friends with people who had uh, access to pills. Um, she said that she started paying more attention to getting pills than to her schoolwork, and her mom started getting on her case because her grades started suffering from that. Um, she was getting in fights with her mom at this time, and it, that caused, later caused her a lot of pain. Um, by the time she was 16, she starts dating someone who sells opioid pills because then she has easier access. And by 17, she's moved out of her house and moved in with this boyfriend who also uses. Um, he gets arrested at one point, and he's thrown in jail for a time. And when he goes into jail, she doesn't have access to any pills, and she suffers withdrawal sickness. And that's manifest in this case by nausea, vomiting, sweating, pain all over, and extreme agitation. This really throws her for a loop. She doesn't understand uh, what's going on. And so she goes to the emergency room. Um, and while there, you know, looking back in the records, she got this diagnosis of viral syndrome, which is not an unreasonable diagnosis, because they didn't, she didn't disclose her use. Uh, she gets hydrated with IV fluids and sent home. Um, and on the way home, she actually hears from a friend of her boyfriend who tells her that you know she she can get better if he just you know she just comes by, and he injects heroin into the vein of her forearm. Um, so when I met her 20 years later, this is the thing that she says: uh, I knew then you know that I had a new plan, and that ended up being dedicating almost all of her time to. Uh, an effort to getting using and getting more money to buy heroin. So, this is this is evident. This is the sort of story that I hear from my patients um, when I'm making a diagnosis of opioid use disorder. There are specifically 11 criteria 
for the diagnosis of opioid use disorder, but you can group them into uh, you really um, three different categories here. So the main one, the main ones are compulsive use. So feeling like you have to use, as she did, she felt like she had to use or else she got sick. Um, and it's continuing to use those things in the face of negative consequences. So even though she knew that if she continued to use them, she would suffer withdrawal if she didn't take them, even though she knew it was risky to inject these drugs, she uh, chose to do that um, or felt compelled to do that. Um, and in fact, the, the, one of the key findings of the research that we reviewed for our report was that this is, this is really caused by repeated opioid use. So the, the more times that you use this medication or this drug, this chemical, uh, the more likely you are to develop an opioid use disorder. Um, but it doesn't happen in like a test tube, right? Opioid use disorder is not like something that happens to, or addiction is not something that happens to robots or to uh, groups of electrons. It happens in the context of a human who has a social environment and who has certain behaviors beforehand. And really, it's the manifestation of those behaviors that drives the diagnosis, right? It's not the actual drug that is the problem uh, for Anna so far. It is the stuff that goes along with it, right? It's the going for the drug in the face of doing worse in school, uh, continuing to go for the drug rather than continue her bond with her mom, uh, these kinds of things. And so what we're going to talk about later is the treatment of it, and that's, that's this last bullet point that medications are intended to normalize uh, the brain structure and function to allow people to normalize those behaviors and, and achieve greater functionality. So this is just a slide showing the brain circuits that are involved. I'm not going to go into too much detail except to note that um, the prefrontal cortex is where people is involved in in judgment, and so if you get you're getting all of these uh, these um, projections up from deeper brain structures affecting your ability to make a good judgment, that's sort of where it comes from. So we're gonna you're gonna see these slides on about seven different times here. They're the the conclusions of our report. And the first one is very, very basic, and I'm not going to go into it too much, but it's just to say that opioid use disorder, in the medical term for opiate addiction, is a treatable chronic brain disease. And it's manifest in these behaviors that I talked about. So back to Anna. She started to recognize that she had a problem um, and, and really deeply felt that she had a problem once her mom got sick in her early 20s, and she wanted to go back to live with her and, and really be able to help her out, but she wasn't able to stop using heroin. Um, every time that she tried to stop, um, even though she was very, very highly motivated and really desired to quit using, she wasn't able to. And, she, and every time that she tried to stop, her withdrawals actually felt like they got worse. She said um, she, tried, she would try to cut down, and even just cutting down led to the sort of presentation that she had uh, that brought her to the ER previously. Eventually, she actually swallowed her pride and went to her dad, um, who you'll recall had an alcohol problem previously. And at, at, at that time, he would actually was in full sustained recovery and was working at an electronics store as a manager and was um, doing quite well. And you know he had a lot of sympathy for Anna's situation and felt like you know he went to a rehab program that he found very helpful. And he said, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna send you there because it worked for me. And if you work the program, it's going to work. And so he sends her there. And she goes through this detox program where they uh, help her with those symptoms that I described, the nausea and vomiting. And they helped her avoid access to heroin by keeping her inside. Um, and she went through, after, after going through that detox, which lasted a few days, she stayed in the program for a full month and worked uh, in groups with other people in recovery. Um, on a 12-step model, the so-called 
uh, mutual support model based upon uh, the principles of alcohols, Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, she didn't hear anything about medications and wasn't referred to like a treatment program for that had medications. Um, and she was really focused on, in her words, being clean, um, uh, which to her meant not being on any kind of substance, any kind of chemical. Um, unfortunately, uh, two weeks after leaving the facility, she ran into an old friend who had some heroin, and she gave it another try. Um, and as she said, it, it, it was off to the races. Um, and she was using daily almost immediately after that. Um, you know, from the report, we said, in fact, in, in our review of the literature, most people who could benefit from medications for opioid addiction don't receive them. So Anna is pretty much a, this is an illustrative case. So only 20% of people with opioid use disorder receive any type of treatment <coughs> in a given year. And even fewer receive medication-based treatment. So, and, and the other interesting thing is that even facilities that say we're going to offer medications to treat uh, your opioid addiction don't offer all options that are available. There are actually three FDA-approved medications, which we'll go through in, in just a couple slides. Um, but most places don't offer all three. And so even if the patient is at a facility, a person is at a facility where they take a medical approach, uh, they may not have all the options that, that are possible. And so, you know, I want, I want to talk to you about those medications because that's kind of the, was the main thrust of our review and the main thrust of our report. And I'll try to explain um, the pluses and minuses of each of them. But our main conclusion of our entire report was that FDA-approved medications to treat opioid use disorder are effective and they save lives. So the three options for treatment of opioid use disorder that are legal in this country are methadone, buprenorphine, and extended-release naltrexone. So let's talk a little bit about what each of those means. This is a, a dose-response curve. Um, uh, demonstrating how each of these things work. So starting with methadone. Methadone is probably the easiest to understand because it is a long-acting version of heroin or morphine or oxycodone. It's a full agonist opioid. It tickles the receptor in exactly the same way that those opioids do. Um, what that does, what that means is it gives you all of the activation, right, that heroin or morphine does. On the plus side, that means that it feels very similar to patients or can feel very similar to patients. On the downside, that means that if you take too much of it, you can overdose, just like if you were taking morphine or heroin um, or oxycodone. Um, Methadone has been around for decades. Um, the research that got it approved for use was done in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and it has been uh, very effective in reducing people's deaths, even though, like I said, you, if you take too much, you can overdose. Um, it was approved for use in the early 1970s under only some very restrictive constraints. Namely, that the only way that you can get methadone for the treatment of addiction is in the context of a special clinic that is regulated and approved by the government. Um, and in those clinics, there are specific requirements for counseling, for urine drug screens, for how many doses you can get at a time based on how long you've been in treatment and how stable you are, et cetera. Um, as an example, in the state of California, you have to go to clinic every single day for the first 90 days that you're in treatment, whether or not you're using any other drugs. So we're open on Christmas. We're open on New Year's. We're open every day and our patients have to come in and to get their medication. Um, there's a lot of drawbacks to that. If you can imagine an epidemic that is being driven in rural use, 
uh, it's hard to have a methadone clinic in a rural area because it's just hard to make that pay when you have all those restrictions. That's methadone. Works really well. Buprenorphine is a partial agonist, so-called because the active, active, activation of the receptors um, peaks at a certain point. If you take too much buprenorphine, you're not going to stop breathing, right? Whereas methadone, you get to here and you're going to die, right, if you, if you take too much, unless somebody comes along and breathes for you or you end up in Kathy's ER and they reverse you and you are able to breathe that way. But buprenorphine, take too much, doesn't matter. Um, it was originally developed as an analgesic and is still used for that, uh, largely in the veterinary uh, community because you can't ask an animal if they're still feeling pain, but you can give them buprenorphine and not worry about killing them by suppressing the respirations. Um, and it's very effective for that purpose. Um, it was, it's also very useful in the treatment of opioid use disorder, and it has some restrictions associated with it as well. It was first approved for that purpose in the United States in 2002. And so in the last 17 years, you know, thousands of people in the United States have been treated with buprenorphine for, for opioid use disorder, for addiction. Um, I always explain it as to, to patients because there's some tricks with it, right? Buprenorphine hits you here, right? If you are sick, if you're in withdrawal like Anna was when she went to the emergency room that time, it will make you well. If you're loaded, on the other hand, and you have methadone or heroin or morphine in your system, it will make you sick because it will outcompete this methadone and bring you down to that level. Um, and that's a, that's a real challenge for getting people onto the medication, honestly. Um, you have to really have it do a good job of educating people and um, helping them understand when they can start taking it. Um, nevertheless, you only have to be sick for a couple hours, really. So most of my patients who inject uh, intravenously from heroin, for example, um, they, are, they feel well. They don't feel sick. They don't feel high, but they just feel well for about five, six hours after they use. Then they start to get sick. If I can get them to hold off for about eight hours, I can probably start them on buprenorphine. Okay? And so that's the trick, is you got to get people that far out. That's if they go intravenously. It's harder with people who use pills. It lasts longer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the last medication is an antagonist. An antagonist, just in this case, in, in the biochemical sense, means a blocker. So, if you have any of this other stuff in your system and you take an antagonist, it makes you go into acute withdrawal. Like that's how naloxone works to make people who are overdosed on the street wake up. Um, in this case, the treatment that we use for the blocker is called naltrexone, and it's an injectable medication that lasts for about a month, goes usually in your glute, in your butt, and, and you come to a doctor's office and they give it to you there. I say doctor, I should uh, re rephrase that, to a medical provider's office because uh, physician's assistants and nurse practitioners can do it as well. Um, doesn't require any special training, doesn't require any special licensing, anything like that. It's very straightforward. Um, and it has a lot of intuitive appeal, you know? If you are somebody uh, who doesn't want to be on anything that is physically dependent, that you're physically dependent on, this is perfect. If you're somebody who's in the AA model of not wanting to be on any mind-altering substance, this is it. Um, parents who can't bear the thought of people, be, their kid being on methadone or buprenorphine really like uh, naltrexone. Um, judges and drug court uh, people, tend to favor this as well uh, for the same reason. And uh, people who are dealing with people who are in incarcerated settings sometimes like this option because um, they uh, also are worried about diversion, meaning that the methadone or the buprenorphine that's handed out to people gets passed to somebody else. Um, going back just one slide, as I said, these things have decades of evidence behind them 
and they reduce all-cause mortality and reduce opioid overdose-related deaths, um, particularly methadone and buprenorphine. And, and that's saying something, right? Like, I am an internist. Most of the stuff I do, I have to treat 100 to 300 people to get to save one life, right? To, to cure one person of uh, colon cancer, I have to screen something like 400, 500 people. Um, in this case, if I am, I know that on a population basis, people who are provided with these medications have two thirds uh, reduced mortality compared to people who with opioid addiction who are not on medication. Um, in addition to that mortality benefit, which I, I, I just can't emphasize enough, but in addition to the mortality benefit, it actually makes people live lives that they want to live, uh, improved social functioning, decreased criminal uh, in justice involvement, um, increased control over their HIV, hepatitis C, other medical conditions, um, and they don't feel like they need to use. So they don't feel the craving anymore. So back to Anna. Um, unfortunately, uh, she, as I said, had gone through this detox and rehab episode and returned to use, or, or in the common parlance, relapsed. Uh, and now, at, now she, at age 30, she actually gets arrested. And she'd been shoplifting many, many times. And finally, um, she, instead of getting into a diversion program, she's arrested and thrown in jail. And while, while she's awaiting trial, she actually goes into withdrawal. And by this time, actually, at San Francisco County Jail, they had started a pilot program to treat people's opioid withdrawal uh, with buprenorphine. And the jail's medical team gave her, gave her some buprenorphine. Um, it relieved all of her symptoms within a half hour. She said it felt really good, and it made her uh, not feel like she needed to use at all. Um, they didn't continue the medication at discharge, uh, although they gave her information on where she could go to get some. Um, and at that time, she felt like she was done. She didn't need any more treatment. Um, and so she didn't connect with a medical provider who could prescribe it. So she relapsed within days of her release. Um, again, uh, most people who could benefit from these medications don't get them. Um, and it shouldn't be surprising to know that opioid overdose is a leading cause of death for people who were recently released from incarceration, and almost nobody who is incarcerated in the United States uh, gets medication treatment. So next step in Anna's journey was that she actually thought that she would do the geographic cure, and so she moved to Las Vegas to stay with her aunt. Um, who actually helped her establish primary care at a clinic. And she f happened to figure out that one of the providers there could help her out and could prescribe buprenorphine. Um, she does really well with it. She remembered what it was like to start on it, and when it was offered, she went for it. Um, she stops using heroin completely and starts working at a grocery store her uh, first steady job in probably 10 years. Um, and then after six months of, of being stable, the hours, the, her hours expanded at her, at her job. And actually, um, that made her miss some of the mandatory counseling that was required by her clinic uh, to, to be able to continue to prescribe her on buprenorphine. They had her meet with drug counselors and groups. Um, and she wasn't able to go to that. And so they said, well, we have to taper you off because you're not uh, conforming to our standards. And um, she actually was OK with that uh, because she felt like now she's going to be able to live a clean, chemical-free life. Um, but by the end of her first year in Las Vegas, she returned to using heroin. And her aunt kicked her out of the house. Um, our third conclusion, this is illustrative, illustrative of our, our third conclusion, which is that all evidence indicates that long-term retention on medication is what is, is what is associated with improved outcomes. You get somebody through a detox and <gasps> discontinue their medication. You discontinue their medication six months in. It doesn't matter. These, they can't even, you can't even get funding to do the randomized controlled trials anymore, because if you do, you're not doing standard of care 
because you have to maintain people every time that they were done, every time that we started to see people tapered off, they return to use. And so if you want the positive outcomes, people need to be retained in treatment. And the way I talk to patients about this is like, you know, I treat hypertension, right? Blood pressure, same way. If circumstances in your life change to the point that you don't need medication anymore, then yeah, I'll stop your blood pressure medicine. What does that look like? That looks like you lose weight, you eat a very low salt diet, you exercise regularly, you don't have any alcohol in your system, um, and we bring you down and test to see if your blood pressure can tolerate it, uh, we'll do that. But the truth is that when I start somebody on an antihypertensive, I'm kind of thinking that this is going to be a long-term medication. Um, and the same thing goes for this type of medication. If you're on treatment, you should stay on treatment, at least on the population level. The other part of this part of the story that I just want to highlight is, is this conclusion from our report, which is that just because you don't have behavioral interventions or because somebody can't make it to, to counseling, that's not a good enough reason to not give medication. So one of the things that I know providers will say is like, I don't have anybody who can counsel my patients, so I don't really want to get into all of that. Um, the truth is that there's no evidence that you need to do any of that in order to make people better. Uh, people tend to figure it out. Um, and I'm um, just to hit it, hit it one more time, most people who uh, could benefit from medication-based treatment don't get it. Um, it turns out that there's inequitable access across po various populations, um, and we can talk more about that if you have questions about that later. What are the barriers that keep people from being able to use it? Well, I, I think number one is this really deep and fundamental uh, misunderstanding about what these meds are about and what we're trying to treat. And a huge amount of stigma towards people who use drugs and to the, drug, the treatments themselves. So people say, oh, you're just replacing one drug with another. And, you know, I'm, I've been around this enough that I'm kind of like, okay, uh, I'm okay with that because if I'm providing somebody with a treatment and they're no longer doing sex work, uh, no longer homeless, no longer um, not in contact with their family and can take good care of their kids, like, that's fine by me. That's good enough for me. I mean, not to mention again that they're still alive, right? They're, there's a greater chance that they'll still be alive. Um, that's fine by me. But not everybody feels that way, right? And so one of the things that I have to always do and what our, our committee was trying to do is just point out that other medications don't have this level of regulation. Uh, other medications don't have this level of uh, negativities just attached to them. And so the more we can do to talk to folks and un help them understand that if they have a loved one who has this problem, it's different than other addictions. It's not the same as alcohol, although I have some good drugs for that too. They're not as effective as these medications are for a more immediately deadly condition. The other thing is that I, I'm saying all this to folks that are mostly lay here, but in my field, right, in medicine, it is completely inadequately, uh, inadequate levels of, of training and education. Um, the fact that I have to try to convince people who are already in practice to do extra training, if they're a nurse practitioner, it's 24 hours. If it's a, a MD, it's eight hours. I have to convince them to do extra training just to be able to legally prescribe one of the three medications. It's just absurd. If we catch people when they're in school, if they, we catch people when they're in training, uh, maybe we'll be able to get them this training so that they use it. But then they may not have supervisors who even know what they're doing. So it's, it's really, we're doing, we're, we're working on this now. One of my main goals is to get as many people trained as possible. Uh, but it's, it's really, we're not, we're not there yet. I mentioned the regulations uh, around methadone and buprenorphine. Um, I don't mention naltrexone here, but it's, it's actually true that the regulations around naltrexone, the functional uh, 
uh, regulations are that in order to get it covered, you have to have a special kind of insurance and a special pharmacy has to fill it and they have to mail it to you and it's, it's not easy either. And that leads to the, to the last point, which is that addiction has traditionally not been viewed as something that doctors and nurses take care of. Uh, we take care of the sequelae, the, the things that come after it, uh, but we don't treat that. That's for like the people themselves to treat, so mutual help groups like NA or AA, or that's for psychologists to treat or social workers to take care of. Uh, or in reality, what we end up doing as a society is that's for the legal system to take care of. Um, and when we do that and we set up uh, financing and payment policies that uh, do not allow a, a physician or a, a nurse practitioner to get paid to provide treatment, you don't do it. Um, and just to, just to point out that, that a lot of this is based on myths. Uh, we uh, published this uh, brief little patient page uh, earlier this year in JAMA Internal Medicine uh, to try to uh, correct or, or reframe some of the thinking about this. Um, I think that most people now, I think, at least cognitively understand that addiction is not a moral failure. It doesn't mean that you're a, a bad person. Um, lots of people, you, I mean, most people uh, use some kind of substance to change the way they feel. Um, I mean, it's just that not everybody ends up uh, with the behaviors that uh, constitute addiction. It's just a medical condition. It's a brain disease uh, with social uh, manifestations. Um, Opioid addiction is different than other addictions in that you can't just quit. Um, unfortunately, that's not enough treatment. Um, and so, you know, as I've been pointing out, you, it needs to be uh, medications that are maintained. Um, methadone and buprenorphine just replace one drug with another. Well, actually, what they do is reduce craving and prevent withdrawal, which allows people to change the behaviors that um, are so harmful to them and to others, and it reduces opioid-related deaths. And lastly, this idea that, oh, I'm going to refer out to somebody else to take care of this um, is actually false. Many people who are not addiction specialists and who are uh, can prescribe medications. OK, back to Anna. So this is where the story makes it makes a really weird kind of, only in San Francisco kind of turn. So Anna comes back to the city, uh, right, still using, after she got kicked out of her house in Las Vegas. And she, <laughs> she runs into that original high school boyfriend in a homeless encampment here. Um, and of course, they take this as like fate bringing them together. Um, and they reform their bond and start dating again. They really, it's, it's a, a deep feeling because they, they feel like this is the universe speaking to them. Um, and they take care of each other on the streets uh, for about two years. And eventually, they end up coming into treatment at the Opiate Treatment Outpatient Program at San Francisco General, where I work. And they um, attempted to stabilize on methadone. Um, Anna ends up getting hospitalized for pneumonia. And when she's there and they do a pregnancy test, it comes back positive. So she resolves immediately to completely discontinue use of her uh, heroin and, at that point, uh, methamphetamine. Um, but while she's inpatient at San Francisco General, she gets picked up for attempting, her boyfriend gets picked up for attempting to rob a convenience store, and he gets moved to a county jail um, after, after serving or standing for the judge in San Francisco, gets sent to a, a jail, a county jail in Southern California on an old charge. Um, and at that county jail, they don't maintain people. On, on methadone, and so he gets detoxed there and goes through withdrawal there while awaiting his trial. Anna, on the other hand, elects to continue with us in, on methadone, and she actually goes into a residential treatment program uh, that's specially designed for uh, pregnant and uh, immediately postpartum women. Um, and that allowed her to continue on her methadone treatment, and they would bring her to clinic once a week and help manage her take-home doses. 
Her baby was born healthy, didn't suffer any neonatal abstinence syndromes, withdrawal syndrome that you're hearing a lot about in the papers probably, um, and uh, went home with her uh, three days later. Um, so the second to last conclusion that we have is that withholding or failing to have available all classes of FDA approved medication for the treatment of opioid use disorder in any care setting or criminal justice setting is denying appropriate medical treatment. Uh, I can tell you that we, most of it, all of us on the committee had decided to include the phrase and is unethical, but we were told by the National Academies that we can't make ethical judgments. Um, we're only there to talk about the science. Um, and it, it just, to go back, this, this, this stark reality is, is, this tells you why, right? Like, I mean, you, you have the same people, same situation going on, and one person gets shunted to the criminal justice world and gets tapered off, and one person is in the medical setting, and they get to maintain and actually do quite well. I'll tell you that it's not incredibly common that people get treated in hospitals for opioid use disorder, and a lot of times that's what, what ends up people driving patients away from us is that if they don't get good treatment when they come into the hospital, they just don't bother to come until it's nearly too late. Um, and so it's just, this one was a, it was a very uh, easy conclusion to come to because um, it is incredibly common uh, in, in this country to not treat this as a disease. Um, and our, our last conclusion was that if, if, this, if we don't do something about this, to, if we don't uh, deal with the barriers that are standing in the way of people's to getting access to treatment, um, we're not going to be able to really address this, this crisis on, uh, as a nation. And, and these in include the things that I talked about earlier. And so I wanted to, to wrap by saying a couple things. One is that uh, specifically uh, with regards to our patients. Um, they save lives, they're effective at helping people do well, and there's a, there's a sort of a deeper, patients that I see a lot of um, have a lot of trauma, and it's a deeper message of we care about you and we have something that we can do for you instead of to you. Uh, so that's number one. And it's because it's based upon good science that I feel comfortable doing it, right? So again, opioid addiction, treatable disease. It's a brain disease. We should treat it like an addiction, not a moral failing, not a bad choice. Um, and, and, and currently, we, we don't get the meds to the people who need them. Uh, and so if you don't do that, you're actually denying them appropriate medical treatment. Um, we identified, uh, as you'll recall, the last um, uh, part of our charge was to identify knowledge gaps and places where we needed more research. Um, the committee felt that we don't have enough information comparing the ones that are approved. So comparing buprenorphine to methadone to naltrexone over the long term. What I can tell you is that um, we have a lot of information on shorter term, namely six months, one year uh, outcomes, and, and it, it goes in about that order. Methadone retains about two-thirds of people in treatment, uh, buprenorphine about 50% in practice, um, which is akin to how, how often people take their antihypertensives or uh, hypoglycemics. And, uh, retention and treatment with naltrexone is very low. It's like 10 to 15 percent. Um, and that's probably related to the fact that if you don't take methadone or you don't take buprenorphine, you feel it, right? You, you go into physical withdrawal, whereas if you don't take the naltrexone, you feel the same. Um, we, uh, we decided that it was important to try to figure out how we can get people to stay in treatment. Uh, through behavioral interventions. Um, it was important to us to note that um, many of the behavioral interventions that are mandated, uh, like the one where Anna was in the clinic and they told her she had to go to a group or else she was going to get kicked out, um, 
or in my practice, the state and feds require that I um, provide uh, counseling, individual counseling to patients for at least 50 minutes a month um, if I'm going to maintain them on, on methadone. Um, those are not evidence-based. There's no evidence for that. What there is evidence for are some behavioral interventions do a good job of helping people stay in treatment or to reduce other drug use, cocaine, alcohol, et cetera. Um, and and our, our point was just to say that we need to do more understanding which behavioral interventions go with which patients in which settings. Um, similarly, we uh, called for the development of uh, treatment guidelines for certain subpopulations. You know, if, if you're going to say that we need to be treating people in a bunch of different settings, um, there's a lot of things that people might need to take into account um, if they're going to be providing methadone in a, at San Quentin, for example. Um, Maybe it, if you're going to be providing buprenorphine to an adolescent population, there's different things that need to be done. Um, the fourth point here, we only have three options, right? And there's only one of each sort of kind. It's either full agonist, partial agonist, or antagonist, all at the opioid receptor. Well, there's a lot of brain up here that doesn't involve the opioid system that maybe you could intervene on to change people's uh, addictive behaviors around the opioids. Um, not only that, but there's other opioids. So in other parts of the world, long-acting morphine works really well for people who have opioid use disorder. Here, the only reason that you can give out long-acting morphine is for chronic pain. Um, but what if we could do some uh, research to see about whether the stuff that works in other parts of the world would work here? In other parts of the world, people use injectable uh, clinics where people come into the clinic and inject hydromorphone, a brand name is Dilaudid, or uh, diacetylmorphine, or heroin itself, that is provided at the clinic. And that's sort of the way that you get people who are um, recalcitrant to other treatments or who aren't interested in methadone or buprenorphine. Um, if you can get them to come into treatment at, and you're providing them with the medication and you're providing them with a space to do it and you're providing them with supervision, your morbidity and certainly your mortality goes way down. Finally, uh, the, from, from my way of thinking, the, the biggest thing um, and the, the best friends that I made on that committee were the policy people. Because to me, if it, 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 you know, all the research and evidence you want, but if you don't change the policies to get the stuff to the people, it ain't going to matter, right? I know what to do. And I know even how to get people to want to try to take the medication, uh, but sometimes it's really hard to uh, make it possible for people to even uh, employ, employ the training that, that they got. If you want to check out the medication, or rather the publication, you can get a free PDF of the whole report. It's kind of, uh, we tried to make it as not dry as possible, as targeted towards lay public as possible. Um, but that's what I've got for you, and I'm happy to take questions. So the question is about um, should we, or is there a movement towards in licensing bodies to make it a, a part of continuing medical education? And I'll go ahead and expand it and say training, training programs for graduate medical education and undergraduate medical education. Um, well, starting at undergraduate level, we're we rolled out our first buprenorphine waiver training actually this month for uh, UCSF School of Medicine and School of Nursing, so nurse practitioners, uh, to be able to take the training before they leave school and even get a little bit of course credit for it, you know, um, with the idea that if we catch them early, maybe they're more likely to use it. But that's partly because we've had been doing for the last eight, nine years trainings at the graduate medical education level for all residents, all uh, physicians who are in training at the university here, we offer it as an option. But not everybody does it, right? So that's one problem. So you're asking, should we make it mandatory? So now at the national level, the graduate you, ACGME, the, the people that regulate our, our residencies, are there's a small movement to, get, to try to get petition them to make it a requirement that everybody gets their waiver training before they leave. 
Um, and then, you know, nationally, what would take an act of Congress, literally an act of Congress, would be to just get rid of the waiver, right? You know, I, I showed you the diagram of how methadone, you can still OD on methadone, but it's real hard to OD on bup. Um, you don't need a special waiver to write a prescription for oxycodone for pain. That can kill you. Buprenorphine, you have to have this special training to be able to prescribe it for opioid use disorder. Like, that doesn't make a lot of sense at all. And not only that, but like, if you're a nurse practitioner, you have to get a whole 24 hours worth of training, uh, whereas MDs have to do eight hours. So, you know, do I think that's gonna happen anytime soon? Probably not, since they just expanded to allow the nurse practitioners even to do it at all in 2016. Um, but that would be the that would be the like immediate impact. Oh, now you don't have this excuse that you can't do it and you have to refer out, right? What was driving the waiver in the first instance? So what was driving the waiver in the first instance? It was um, uh, in 2000. Uh, there was this idea that we should allow people to prescribe buprenorphine, but everybody was nervous that oh my gosh, like. What if we don't know what we're doing with these people who have this addiction problem, right? And so it was less about the, they weren't thinking about it in terms of pharmacology, but in terms of people, you know? The war on drugs is really war on people kind of thing. And, um, and so they were, that's what drove it in the first place. And it was sort of a concession, right? The, the National Institute on Drug Abuse and SAMHSA um, were recommending for this this to be rolled out as a, approved as a treatment by, FDA approves it, then roll it out as treatment. Uh, but the DEA was worried about controlling the supply of drugs. And so that, that was sort of the, the compromise. And of course the, the uh, Congress wasn't super excited. They, you know, they don't know, they don't know the pharmacology, it doesn't matter to them. What matters is uh, there are these people who use drugs and this is what we're gonna do to control the situation. Yeah, it's a great question, and it's a sad history, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so why is it that that there's this problem now? Like the story that gets told is that, and and I think there's some credence to, is that if you have a large supply of opioids suddenly introduced into a system, as it was in the late '90s with the wider prescription of uh, oxycodone, of hydrocodone, you know, long-acting oxycontin that wasn't really long-acting because you could crush it up and snort it, you know, that kind of thing. What was, why did that cause a problem? It caused the problem because most people who use opioids, even if it's heroin, most people who use it don't get addicted, right? But some do, and it doesn't matter why you started taking it, right? Like, there's, there was this whole myth that, oh, well, if you have real pain, you won't get addicted. Because people who have pain, we can feel bad for. But people who have an addiction problem, it's their fault, right? And so there was this, this, this separation between the pain and addiction communities in, in medicine. Um, and this idea that you could, you could introduce more opioids into the system, the, system being United States society and not suffer consequences from it. When in fact, I think that the natural experiment shows that if you have greater exposure, some of those brains are gonna get addicted. And then the addiction is just all of the stuff that goes with wanting to get that substance. And it turns out that even if we, as we have in fact, uh, cut down on the number of prescription opioids available, uh, it has done nothing to the death rates. So in the United States, it peaked, the peak of uh, opioid prescriptions happened in about 2010, 2011. Uh, and since that time, twice as many people have died of an opioid overdose, right? So probably there's some lag, so there's that. But more importantly, uh, enterprising business people figured out that there was a huge market now for people who needed opioids, right? And these business people 
don't worry about regulation so much. And they moved a lot of product, uh, heroin and now illicitly manufactured fentanyl, into the United States. And so, and if they can undercut on cost and hassle and make it easier for you to get heroin than to get buprenorphine for your treatment, it's just like, you're, 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 it's setting things up for an ex expa expanding problem, not something that uh, you know, an epidemiologist would say, this is just absurd. We just created the conditions. So that there's unlimited Great question. So the question was, does this work? Let's say Anna lived in a different town with, like in, I don't know, let's say Indiana, my hometown, Coffeyville, Kansas. Uh, and she didn't have, in the early 2000s, there was no heroin in my hometown, none. Uh, let's say she picked up a, a problem and she developed an opioid use disorder with just the pills. Would it work, do these medications work to treat? Yes. And, and this was very uh, elegantly done in a number of different studies, but um, in, in one study that I, I think is the, the best of the bunch, it was called the Prescription Opioid uh, Addiction Treatment Study, POTS, and they actually did a couple different things. They were using buprenorphine to treat, and they were also, they randomized people to get a longer course or a shorter course. Right? And, and they also randomized those people to get extra special counseling with expert counselors or just to see their doctor and get a prescription. And it turns out that the people, number one, the prescription opioid people did just as well when they were prescribed buprenorphine as people who had a history of injection drug use. And number two, that the people who got the extra special intensive counseling did just as well or just as poorly, depending on how you look at it, as the people who were <laughs> prescribed buprenorphine. And then sort of it's a, I'm a broken record up here, but the people who were tapered off earlier did worse than the people who stayed on the medication for a longer period of time. So it's, it's a, it's a, there's this idea that somehow the people who were on prescription opioids, uh, uh, or who used pills, pharmaceutical grade stuff, uh, are somehow different than the people who uh, use heroin, but I don't think that the brain really knows the difference, is the, is the bottom line. And it, it, and it doesn't matter, what matters, the, the, I, I've been trying to come up with a way to say it, but the only thing I can say is like, it's really not the chemical. The, the important thing about the addiction is, is the stuff that you're, you do to get the chemical, Right? You break the law to get, get the money to pay the guy, whatever. Um, and, the, and you inject in a uh, alleyway somewhere and you overdose or you are so ashamed of it that you're hiding by yourself and you inject by yourself and nobody's there to help you out if you die. Um, and then it's the stuff that you do to put it in your body. Right? So the stuff that you do to put it in your body uh, is also problematic. So if you inject with a needle that's been used by somebody who has hep C, you're very likely to get hep C, HIV, similar thing. Um, if you're smoking it, you can have problems in your lungs, as you might imagine. Um, it's, it's less the chemical because, as we know from the prescription opioids, people can take them forever and not end up with problems. Um, so it's not about the chemical, and that's what makes it okay that methadone and buprenorphine are also opioids, right? It's the stuff that goes with it, that if you can wipe that stuff out, then you put the kibosh on the epidemic. Like, all of the bad stuff is from the behaviors that are associated with it. Thank you very much for your attention and excellent questions.